starting with the study designs and field protocol and so on. Just a couple of slides to remember you that all of these materials are on the website. And of course, I forget to mention before, but uh, the slides will be available for you. I think, I don't know if Joaquin already sent or not, but the PDF will be uh, available for you. Okay, in any case, <clears throat> regarding the study designs, I divide my talk in four key uh, points, in my opinion. The first one is before to go to the field. I mean, when we design the location of the cameras and we design the the, the study design, essentially. Then we go to the field and we have the real ones deployment of the cameras. We also need to uh, discuss a little bit about the settings of the camera traps. And finally, the points uh, regarding the last question of uh, Stoyan and also some ideas already discussed and commented by Jim uh, will be discussed and explained properly in, in and more in detail in, in this last point. So, okay. Um, we are, as we said before, we are going to use or to apply the random encounter model. And I right here remember that this design is useful also for uh, other methods. Okay, but random encounter model obviously random means random. So uh, our design, this is my uh, a screenshot of our uh, study designs and each point represent the, the location of a camera trap. So this is a fully random design. Or we can also work or with a systematic and regular grids of a camera trap location with a random origin. So essentially, any of these designs will be useful to then apply the random uh, encounter model or other methods. OK. And uh, the key concept is that cameras should be placed randomly with respect to the animal movement. And obviously, please, I'm going to repeat this in other uh, slides, but don't bait, don't choose the best place like food, uh, like food, uh, uh, like artificial uh, uh, feeding points or water holes or uh, wildlife strikes or anything that is not random in relation to the movement of the animals. Okay, this is very, very important to then apply the this type of, of method. So the first point is to create this computed computer uh, is a mistake here, generated location of uh, camera traps. And you can obviously do that using any uh, geographical software. But in case of Sanof, you don't have uh, necessary skills with EIS and include here this link to the to a website that will be useful for you to do it very uh, easily, even if you don't have uh, necessary skills in EIS. OK, so if you click in this link, now I'm going to do a, a very fast example. But if you click in this link, then you will have this explanation. And you will enter in this website. OK, so I I want to do uh, this example. So first at all, uh, we need the this key ML file. So for that, obviously, there are many options to do that. But the simple one, probably, if you don't have the, the enough skills in GIS, is go to uh, Google Earth and then um, I don't know. You go to the study area. Let's say that we go to Ibiza. For instance, we are going to create a really interesting point for the observatory in Ibiza. You go, obviously, in your language, uh, but you go here, click in um, new site, and you click here in new polygon. So imagine that uh, this is your study area. So now it's very easily, let's say that this is our study area okay this is just an example um then we change or you write the number the name of the study site so let's say i don't know the name of our study site and uh, we then save us in uh, in any folder, for instance, 
in downloads in my case. Okay. So then, um, moment, sorry. If you click uh, here, you will go to this website and you just here upload your um, KM, KML file. Okay, here it is. And <clears throat> here it is. And then here is uh, our study site. And for instance, uh, we are sent to you uh, 12 camera traps and we are going to move twice. So, and it, it will be explained uh, later on, but let's say that finally we will have a 36 camera location. And here this is the, the polygon that I drew before. And um, yeah, if you click here on generate grid, here you have 36 camera trap uh, location following a regular grid, as I, as, as I said before. And then if you click here in download location, you will uh, have, you see here, a, a CCU file in which you can find the, the coordinates of the of the cameras, okay? Just a very fast ex, uh, example example for those that don't have experience on, on GIS so, and so on. So, okay. and how many placement, okay? Why I uh, select 36. So the number of placement, and this is also included in, in the paper that uh, I commented before in my previous talk, uh, and that will be available online, I think, that soon, maybe in this week or in the next, week, uh, the next one, I hope. The number of placement is important to improve the precision of uh, our density estimates, okay? So here uh, we have this a value 0 0.05 or 3 for uh, mathematics guys is the uh, concentration parameter of negative binomial distribution and you know that um, you know that a Poisson distribution for instance is useful for counts but when the uh, distribution of counts is highly aggregated then we have to move to the negative binomial distribution and as low it is this value and the minimum is zero it means that higher is the aggregation of the count in our data. In this case, the aggregation of the encounters in our camera trap. So in this case, you can see here that uh, most of the, the encounters is in this camera. The, the site of the circle is proportional to the number of the encounter. Then we have only two more cameras with, let's say, a high proportion of the encounters, and most of them only have one encounter or zero encounters. Okay, so this is a highly aggregated distribution. At this value increase you can see here that even this is also an aggregated distribution of contacts uh, in this case the distribution is a little bit more regular or less aggregated in comparison with that so in any case when we apply random design or regular grids, like in this case you will have uh, usually this aggregation distribution of encounters in your camera trap so uh, in this part of the plot of the plot, you can see how then the coefficient of variation, you know, the, the the precision improves because the coefficient of variation decreases as the number of camera trap placement, you know, the number of camera trap location, if you prefer, increase. So for a highly, highly and extremely aggregated uh, scenario of population, like in this case, with a uh, more or less, we will need around 60 camera trap location for a coefficient of variation with 0.2 or 20%, which is usually uh, considered a reference in ecology studies. But if your scenario or the distribution of your species is more, is less aggregated, like in this case, with 30 or 40, uh, with more than 20 essentially, you will have a coefficient, of, a coefficient of variation of lower than 0 0.2 or lower than 20%, okay? So as more placements, as better in terms of uh, precision, okay? This is the, the important idea at this point. So obviously with from 45 to 60, uh, we will have a coefficient of variation uh, <clears throat> lower than 0 0.3 even for the 
uh, highly aggregated scenarios, but we know that go to the field and so on is quite time consuming and expensive. So we plan to uh, deploy these 12 cameras in, in, in your study area and move twice. So then I have then a, a better slide, but uh, we plan or we recommend to at least sample 36 placement or uh, camera trap location, okay, with your 12 cameras. If you have more cameras or more availability to go to the field and move it one more time, change the location one more time, this will improve the, the, the precision uh, clearly, okay? So as more camera trap placement as better for you and for the precision of the density estimates. Okay, and as I said before, the aggregation determines the precision for a given number of, of camera trap placement. So, and here uh, you have the results of, uh, of this regular okay, distribution of points that I showed you before in the example. So we have, as I said before, 36 camera traps uh, placement or location, and we only have 12 cameras. Let's say that we are, that you only have 12 camera device, so 12 units, 12 physical cameras. So you can put first, uh, the re in, you can select first uh, the, the red location. One month later, you can, uh, this is the wrong one. In the wrong, one month later, you go to the field and this camera here move to this location. So now you have the, the blue location of the cameras. And one month later, more or less, you go to the field and you move the location of this camera to this point, okay? And at the end, we have covered or we have sampled the 36 location covering all the study area, but only with 12 uh, camera camera device or camera physical camera, okay? And as I said before, more or less during one, three or uh, or or four weeks in each this in each round will be useful to finally have the two or three uh, three months more or less of the study period with our 12 cameras. But as I say before, if you are available or you have time or resources or whatever to go to the field and move one more time the, the location of the camera, then you will have instead of uh, 36 placements, you will have 48 uh, placements. And as you can see here, the improvement of precision is quite high because uh, with 36 placement, you will be more or less between 0 0.15 or 50, yes, 0 0.15 to 0 0.4, more or less, in, sat, in some point in between these two values. But uh, if you move one more time, you will be for sure lower than uh, you will have a coefficient of variation lower than 0 0.3 which is really nice and probably you will be around in average around 0 0.2 or even lower close to 0 0.1 or 10 or 10 percent sorry of coefficient of variation and okay now we know that we we are going to apply a regular grid or a fully random design we know that we are going to sample a uh, 36 location potentially uh, 48 and when we go to each of these individual placement in our study area what we have to do and this is already explained in previous and wild courses and so on but just a, <clears throat> a friendly reminder so uh, the idea is always to place the camera as closer as possible to the computer generated location okay and i know that sometimes it's a uh, impossible or very difficult or even impossible to go to some location because of the habitat uh, challenges and the fieldwork challenges, I know. But in this case, uh, if you cannot go to the to the same location that uh, you generate with your computer, always try to set the camera as close as possible. And then uh, if you can set the camera in the same micro habitat in which the initially initial uh, computer generated location is uh, as better, okay? Uh, then in this buffer area around your uh, computer generated point, you, I recommend to set the camera in a 
a small area, you know that the that the camera's field of view of any brand is usually the angle is uh, around 50 degrees, more or less. There are wider and there are other which have a, a field of view or an angle of view around 40 or 42 degrees. But in general, think, think in mind that this is between 40 and 60 degrees in general. And the detection distance is always uh, or usually lower than 10 meters. So we have, in fact, a really small uh, uh, area to place the camera. So we don't need to have a very big area with a perfect uh, uh, without vegetation and with a total uh, flat terrain and so on. We just need a small area in which to set, in which to place the camera. So as ground is uh, reasonably, uh, sorry, as sorry, try to avoid uh, extremely road terrain, okay? Because then, if you set the camera in a very terrain with a lot of uh, 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 with, which is not flat, you will have problems then for fit the camera properly and to optimize the the operation of the of the infrared de detection sensor. Okay. And um, regarding to move vegetation, we know uh, I think that most of you will have experience with camera traps. So, and you already know that vegetation usually causes a blank picture, which is uh, photos or videos in which the camera is activated only only because of the movement of the vegetation, but not because there are an animal. So in this case, obviously, we need to remove vegetation, but as less as possible, okay? Far away from uh, four or five meters for most of the camera, of the cameras is the probability of the grass activating the cameras is very low. So we don't need to create an I think that I have also then in other slides. We don't need to create a football stadium in front of in front of, in front of uh, our camera. I mean, we don't need to remove all the vegetation around, let's say, a buffer of 15 meters or 10 meters from the camera. We just need to remove uh, the minimum vegetation as possible because then the animals react. This is not a question of uh, effort of human power and so on. It's a question that if we remove all the vegetation around the camera, probably or for sure the animals will change uh, their behavior and maybe we are increasingly or decreasingly artificially the the number of encounters and also the movement patterns of the individuals. Okay. Um, the next point is just to place the cameras always facing north, more or less north. And this is not related with the RDM or with the estimation of density. This is more related with camera traps used in general. Because, uh, for instance, if you set your camera fast in the east in the morning you, uh, during the, the sunrise, you will have the sun in front of your camera and you will not see, you will not be able to see anything. And if you set your camera fast in the west, for instance, during, during the sunrise, you will have the same problems. So, Try to fix the camera facing north, more or less. Okay. And then uh, for our target species, which are medium mammals, let's say wild boar, fox, roe deer, wolves in some study areas, and so on, uh, the optimal uh, height for the camera is 50 centimeters above the ground, which is more or less the shoulder height of a wild boar and a fox and a roe deer and so on. And then in this way, we reduce the number of blank photos because of the vegetation, and we optimize the performance of the peer sensor or the passive infrared sensor to detect the, the animals. And, uh, okay, the camera should be perpendicular to the ground, so it means that the sensor should be parallel to the ground. So. If you are in a flat area, this is quite simple, but if you are in, in an area with, with a high slope, then you have to place the, the camera perpendicular to the ground, and then the sensor, the, sen the peer sensor uh, should be parallel to the ground, okay? To avoid to sensor go to the ground so fast, or to avoid to the sensor go to the aid and don't detect anything. And in the previous slide, I saw how to do, and here I saw what not to do. Okay, so 
as mentioned before, we need a random design. OK, so please don't place the camera in those points or trees or whatever that you think that are good or do, that you think that you will optimize the number or increase the number of record of any species. OK, just place your location random in in your study area. Obviously, don't use any type of base, attract, attractants, lures, or whatever, for sure. Don't uh, place the, the cameras in human paths or in wildlife trails, okay? The, again, the placement of the camera, the final placement should be random. It doesn't mean that if in some of your location of your 36 location or 40 location or whatever, one of these cameras uh, is in an area with a high uh, density of wildlife trails, then you can place this camera uh, with a wildlife trail in the field of view. But this is one camera or two cameras. You don't have to place all the cameras in uh, wildlife trails or human paths, okay? And as uh, described before, don't create full football stadiums in front of your cameras, okay? Just remove the minimum or the needed vegetation to avoid blank photos, but to, uh, you have to find the uh, optimal point between blank photos and uh, changing animal behavior, okay? So just remove from three to five meters, more or less, is more than enough to avoid a high proportion of blank photos in, with your camera trap uh, units. Always, I, I also recommend in the case that you have option to set the sensitivity of the camera, you can work with low sensitivity, okay? Instead of work with high sensitivity, because if you work with high sensitivity, for sure you will have high proportion of photos of the vegetation. And obviously don't move, don't smoke, sorry, don't pee, don't eat, and so on in the camera trap uh, placement. And regarding the materials, I recommend to don't use this type of tools when you go to the field, okay? Because then you are, uh, with this type of tools, you usually found uh, you tend to increase the the vegetation that you remove or that you clean, okay? So as lower vegetation as better. So I intentionally take this photo to say that you don't have to do that in uh, when you uh, set your camera up, on, okay? You only have to remove the minimum vegetation as, as possible. And this type of tools uh, for me is more recommended than the, the previous one. And um, okay, so continue with the settings of the camera traps. Because now we know we have the, the computer generated location. We have gone to one of these locations. We have set our camera. We have cleaned the minimum vegetation. And now we are ready to set the camera. So uh, the camera should be uh, operational all the day. So during the day and during the night, because as said before, we are interested in. Uh, the community of mammals in the steady area, and we know that some of them have are more active during the day, and other ones uh, or other species are more active during the night. So cameras should be work all the day and night. We recommend to work uh, with photos in a vast mode. So this is essentially like a video because you have theoretically more than one photo per second or usually one photo per second so this is like a video essentially but for uh, for then process the pictures and use the artificial uh, tools intelligent tools and so on is better to work with photos and here uh, you have to set the maximum number of photos per activation and it depends on your camera uh, if I'm right, I will send Browning to you and the maximum in Browning is the rapid fire mode, which takes eight photo per each activation. OK, so when an animal enters in the field of view and the camera is activated, the camera automatically takes eight photos. OK, 
and if the animal continue uh, in the in front of the camera, then the camera is activated again because we set the minimum time lapse or quiet period between activation, and we will have other more eight photos for this uh, animal or for this encounter. And with this high uh, number of photos per each animal, we then are able to, as Jim commented before, to estimate the speed or to recreate or represent the trajectory of the individual or each animal in the field of view. Okay. Um, also, uh, activate in your camera that time and day is stamped on the photo in the lower part of the photo because then it is useful to you to know when these encounters, uh, when these animals enter in the field of view and so on. Uh, as commented before, sensitivity low is usually nice for our target species, which is quite high. We are not working with, at least by the moment, with uh, mammals, with a small mammals, sorry, like mouse and so on. We are working with foxes or rabbits and so on. So this is this sensitivity works well for our species. And the flash intensity is quite difficult to to say a general rule, like for instance, work with a uh, blast mode or work with the minimum uh, time between activation. The flash mode depends on how dense each, uh, each of your camera trust placement. So, uh, but the important idea is to regulate your flash intensity uh, depending of your uh, of your individual camera trust placements, okay? And try to avoid, obviously, overexposed photos in which it's quite difficult to then identify the location of the leg of the fox or the wild boar or whatever. Um, regarding uh, the picture quality, we also recommend the lower. I know that with high quality, you will have better and really nice picture, but thinking in a practical way, if you set the picture quality as minimum, which is really for growing is four uh, megapixels, then you optimize uh, the memory the memory cuts, okay? And this is quite nice. I prefer to have more photos with a low quality than go to my camera one month later and uh, realize that the car is full with high uh, quality photos, but we miss, let's say, one week or two weeks of our study period. Okay. And uh, some cameras, and in Browning, this is called Timeless Blue. So when you activate your camera, you will find in the menu something similar or in the setting something uh, like Time Lapse Plus. So this allows you to combine in your camera motion activated photos with a timeless photo. Timeless photos is that you set your camera to record one photo every day at 12 o'clock or at 10 o'clock in the morning or at any time that you that you define. But this is very useful as uh, described here to know when the camera was uh, operational because imagine that we set uh, our camera today, and this is only on, only motion activated, and we come back to our uh, uh, study sites one month later, for instance, and we know that the last photo of a fox is, uh, I don't know, 10 days ago. So we don't know from this last photo 10 days ago to uh, the day in which we are checking the, the camera, if during these 10 days the camera was working or no. Probably no, and for that we don't have any photos, but probably the camera was working, but no, nothing enters in the field of view, which is quite usual when we work with random location, and for that we don't have photos, okay? So if we have uh, this timeless photo every day, one photo or two photos, one during the day and during an other one during the night, we already know the last day in which the camera uh, was working properly because of the battery or because of other reason. Okay, so coming back to our example, our last photo of Fox uh, was 10, 10 days ago, but now let's say that we have photos of this timeless photo until uh, five, day, five days ago. Okay, so now in this case, we already know and we perfect know that our camera was working properly 
until five days before that we go to check the, the, the battery and the memory card and so on. Okay. And remember, this is time last plus option in browning uh, camera traps and other uh, brands like Roconis or Boost and whatever have also the possibility or include the possibility to, to combine time last with motion activated cameras. Okay. So just a screenshot of my previous slide in the first talk this morning, in which I said that uh, is very important for any of the method, but also for REM to locate the location, to locate the animals in the field of view. So, and here I'm going to divide my talk in two options, the present, which is the things that we are doing now, and the future, which is the, the, the protocol that we will apply when all these tools that uh, Jim already described properly will be available in in Aguti, in Aguti, okay? So uh, starting with the present, <clears throat> as probably you also know, because in NSWILE uh, courses we apply the same protocol. What we do, what we did when we set each camera trap location in in the field is to place reference. Uh, in two meters and a half intervals. Okay, so we put this, these sticks here, you can see, or these branches or the stones in this case, in two meters and a half, five meters, seven meters and a half, and 10 meters from the camera. Okay, and you have here two photos of the same, <coughs> sorry, of the same camera trap location. So this is the photo taken with the camera trap, and this is, a, in my opinion, a very useful photo when you process, process the uh, the photos manually that you take with your mobile phone and you in this case you have other uh, perspective that is very useful then to try to identify where the location where the animals are uh, in the field of view okay so uh, and here you can see for instance this branch represent the because is exactly where the these sticks are uh, represent the two meters and a half reference this big stone here that you can see is very close to this stick is five meters and here we have this other group of stones which is seven meters uh, and a half from the camera okay and as I said before take a photo with your mobile phone is very useful and in some courses say this the, this idea of take the photo with your mobile phone and some of you takes the photo place the the mobile the mobile sorry in the same location or just in front of the camera and take the photo, but this is not useful. The idea is to have, a, as in this slide, two photos with two different perspectives of the same area. So we have the, the photo of the camera trap, which is, let's say, or should be, say, or should be, uh, be parallel to the, to the uh, surface of the ground. And we take this second photo, this one, with the mobile taking to record in more or less as showing here this angle, okay? Obviously we have here the reference of the stone of uh, two meters and a half, five meters and so on, okay? And then you have here other example in which we have then, we obviously, sorry, we obviously then remove these artificial sticks and this white and, and red, uh, signal and so on, because if not, we are uh, changing the, the behavior of the animals a lot and we don't want to modify the area because of removing vegetation or because of uh, leaving in the field of view these human sticks and so on. So we remove all of them and then we, then we, we have something like that. So you can see here the stones are two, five meters and a half, this big stone are five meters, more stones here, at seven meters and a half and so on. Then one day later or one week later or one year later, we have the photos of the animals. And here we have this whale board and using this reference, and this is the, the stone of five meters. In this case, we know that the location of this animal is uh, represented here in this part of the plot is more or less uh, here. Okay, so this is how we have been working in the, in the last years, and and then we later on we will see how to use these artificial intelligence tools. 
Uh, and here we have other photos of the same idea. We place this reference at two meters and a half, five, seven and a half, and ten meters. We put the stones in this case, and we have the reference at this distance. And finally, we remove everything and we only leave these stones. Okay, and then if you have a photo of a wild war, this is very useful to know in which distant intervals or which is the location of the animals in the field of view. And here, one more example, just to give you more ideas using branches and covering the angle of the field of view. And here it's quite easy to see, as I said before, that the field of view of the or the angle of view of our camera traps is quite narrow. So this means that out of here, the animal, the we don't see anything in the camera trap because it's out of the field of view. And the same in this line, okay? And here is the same. This is the area from here to here. You can see that this is not an straight like line. It's just an, uh, let's say, a, a, a circle, okay? And you can see also here. This is the area that is sampled with our camera trap. So obviously, don't make sense to place more reference outside or remove vegetation outside of the of the area that our camera is actually sampling. Okay, so this is what we do now and we have done in the last year. But in the future, as Jim commented before, we will use this magic one. I create this nice name. And the first thing is how to create this pole or this magic one. Okay, and this is a uh, quite easy. And we have a video that I that uh, I think that Joaquin will share with you, or maybe he he has already shared with you this video. But uh, I'm going to activate the video here. Is possible? Okay, here it is. But no, it's not here. One moment, sorry. Yeah, here it is the video. Okay, so you have this video in the materials of the course. And um, okay, what we what we uh, need for do this uh, this pole. So we need a pole with a length longer with lo uh, Sorry, we need a pole longer than one meter. Between one meter, one meter point two to one meter and a half is perfect. Okay, but the the important thing is longer than one meter. But if you have a pole of two meter, is nice. But you only need something a little bit longer than one meter. Then you need a scissors, a marker, and uh, and a tape for measuring the distance. Okay, so this is our simple materials. After that, um, we mark in 20 centimeters intervals uh, our pole. Okay, so we mark this, let's say that this is zero, we mark 20, 40, 60, 80, and one meter. Uh, this is obviously centimeters, and this is one meter. Okay, we do these marks. After these marks, we place this. Uh, this place this in my case i use black uh, this black marker imagine that your pole is from other color you can use the important thing is that you use a marker with a color quite different or the color of your pole okay so it could be black and white or uh, i don't know white and red or whatever okay uh, okay and then as Describe here is important, and I'm going to say then a, a higher quality picture that the limit of this market is exactly on the on these 20, 40, 60, 18, and one meter marks. Okay, and as you can see here also in 20 in 20 centimeters we place only one mark, in 40 we place two marks, in 60 we place three marks, in 80 we place four marks, and in one meter we place five marks. The important one is only the one which is in the limit, so 60, 40, and 20, and so on. But as we no, once we place more, I mean, as, sorry, as we don't place the same number of marks in all the distance, then when we have the photo of our camera trap, if we only see a, a proportion of the pole and we see two marks and then three marks, for instance, we know that this is 40 and 60, okay? Because if we only place one mark in each distance and we only see a proportion of the pole in which there are one mark 
another one we don't know if this is from 40 to 60 or from 60 to 80 or from 20 to 40 okay and yeah it's always nice to include this help for your staff or for even for you because sometimes you remember that you can put the pole in the wrong position okay so remember the only one mark is 20 centimeters and obviously this is close to the ground and the higher number of marks will be on the top of your pole when you put it in front of your camera. Okay. And here you have the video. You see the ground here in this case. You see the mark exactly the upper limit at 20 centimeters and only one mark. If we continue, um, one moment. Um, here. Oh, Sorry. Okay, now we have to start again. Sorry. Okay, here we are. So you can see here 40 centimeters and exactly the lim the upper limit of this black mark is in 40 centimeters. Okay, no, it's not in the center, it's in the limit. And we have two marks, one here, another one here. We know that only the upper one is the important. We have in 60 centimeters here and we have one mark and again the upper limit is in 60. These two ones are not important. It's not important at what distance or what height is this mark. It's just to know that we are in 60 centimeters. Okay. Uh, the same idea with uh, 80. Here it is, the limit and four marks. And finally with one meter. You can see here one meter and five marks. And for that, it's not relevant if here we have 10 centimeters more of pole or half a meter more longer or whatever. We just need as minimum one meter. Okay. And then you go to the field, and I will explain it uh, later, but I want to explain here that in this case, we place the camera is setting in the field, in this case in my garden, but <laughs> it's not important. Um, and we see only a, uh, we probably, when we put it too close to the camera, we will not see all the pole. So we don't know if this is, if here we have one more mark or two more marks. So for that, as we play here two marks and here, and we, and we see here, sorry, three marks, we know that this is 40 centimeters and we know that this is 60 centimeters. Okay, exactly this limit and exactly this limit. And uh, that's all. Okay, you have this video in your materials. Okay. So continue with the cali with the automatic calibration of the of the cameras. Uh, we know how to place the cameras. We first have generated our computer location. We have then go to the field. We have doing or set the camera to take. Uh, as more possible as photos and to be operative all the day and so on. We have our uh, magic wand or our pole and then uh, we have to calibrate the camera in the field. Okay, so the important point is that uh, first at all you have to set your camera properly and to check that they is perpendicular to the ground and so on. And when you have your camera firmly uh, to the tree, for instance, let's say, or to uh, sticks, in maybe in some cases, then you calibrate the camera. Because if not, if you uh, do this calibration with the pole that now I'm going to explain, and then you move the camera to check the batteries or to check the photos or whatever, a uh, really small movement or change in the camera, I mean, from here to here, just a couple of degrees, will change your calibration uh, dramatically. Okay, so the first point is to set the camera firmly and then to do the calibration. So, uh, and this is what I think Stoy and you asked before. Okay, so starting from one meter, so very close to the cameras to the maximum distance, uh, you have to hold the pole and then wait a couple of seconds, two, three, or five seconds that your camera is. Uh, is activated and record one photo or two photos of this of you with the pole at different distance. Okay. And the important idea also is that the pole should be perpendicular, as you can see here, to the ground. Okay. So if you are in a, your camera location is in a 
point with high slope, then your pole should be uh, perpendicular to the ground. Okay. And if you are in a flat area, this is simple, but always the pole should be perpendicular to the ground. And okay. And this is quite nice also. Uh, as I said before, you have to wait three, four, or five, or even 10 seconds. Okay. The important thing is that you have many photos. Or, or you are sure that your camera at least take one photo of you in each of this placement inside of the field of view. And you have to indicate when the pole is perpendicular to the ground. And for that, you can use this mask that, I, uh, that I'm doing here. Why? Because you know that your camera or our camera uh, will be set to take as, for instance, eight photos per activation and then reactivate again with a minimum time lapse of zero seconds or one second as maximum and then activate again. So when you are moving uh, inside of the field of view, your camera will be taking photos potentially continuously. Okay. So you will have this type of photos. And here you can see only the pole, and here you can see me moving with the pole. But as you can see, is in this case, it's not. Uh, it's not in the ground, it's a little bit upper, and in this case, it's not perpendicular, it's climb. Okay, so then when you uh, process and and when you do the calibration in Naguti, these photos are not useful. Obviously, in this case, I think in this example, it's quite obvious because we know that this mark is 20 centimeters from the ground. Okay, the height of this mark is 20 centimeters, but from the 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 starting of the pole, not 20 centimeters in this case, because the pole is not in the ground. Okay, it's not resting in the ground. So in this case, as I did, uh, as I, do, I did it, we know then that this photo is useful to do the calibration and to do to our camera trap in Aguti that this is uh, 40 centimeters. And in this case, here we only have the reference of 40 centimeters. Okay, but this is not useful and this is not useful. Okay. So, uh, how many times? Uh, continue with the with the question of uh, Stoyan. So, in this case, I, I know that Jim said that ten times more or less you have to cover the field of view. But here I write twenty to twenty-five. And why did? Because uh, if you have experience with camera traps. You know that camera sometimes or usually is not activated properly. Okay, so maybe here if you do 20 to 25 location with you and the pole in the field of view, probably you don't if, imagine that you do 20 times. Probably you don't have 20 photos. You will then have 16 or 15 or 19 because sometimes, especially if you are far away of the camera as you are alone, the camera is not activated. Okay, so for that I recommend to you to do more or less between 20 and 25. And then if you miss some of this location because of the camera is not activated or because of other reasons, then you will have enough sample site. Okay, if you only do that, uh, let's say 10 times, and and I don't know if you do it uh, 10 times and you miss three of these activation, then you only have seven location of the poles and then your accuracy will be very low okay so i recommend you to do between 20 and and 25 with in fact it's just one more minute or two more minutes at maximum in each field in each camera trap location okay this is not uh, time consuming it's just one more minute or two more minutes in the field of view or for setting each camera and then you will have a proper uh, calibration of your camera. If you want to do that very fast and you only do that 10 times and probably you will miss some of this uh, activation, then your calibration will be very bad and then probably you will miss uh, everything, okay? Every, every other data. So, as you can see in that side, the important point is to repeat it. it. Uh, in this case, you have 25 uh, placement, obviously. It's one of these points represent the location of your camera. You can see that here, this is uh, regularly distributed in the field of view from close to the camera to imagine to the longer distance or uh, the, la the yes the the far away distance in which your camera is able to record animals, 
And here I represent uh, how don't do this calibration, okay? So don't do this type or this type of calibration because we are not covering uh, homogeneously the field of view of the camera. Here we have aggregated in longer distance and here we got aggregated in closer distance, but this is not useful. And in this case, as you can see, we only have five locations, which is very few because probably you will lose some of them because the camera is not activated. So remember, or my advice is to do it between 20 or 25 times, and then you will find you will have more than 15 uh, camera uh, stick or pole location, which is very useful. And here you have an example with real photos, in which probably is more useful to you. And you can see that uh, we have one, two, three, four. So 28 photos here. And you can see that this guy is covering all the field of view in the camera from very close here to very far here and flow from the left side, in this case, for instance, to the center of the field of view here or more to the right side, like in this case. OK, and obviously. You have to be uh, behind your pole. This is quite a, a stupid comment, probably, but don't put yourself between the camera and the pole because if not it's impossible to see anything and my advice is to always do that when you are with the pole or uh, perpendicular to the ground and uh, resting in the ground okay you can do this or any signal that for you is useful to then one month later or three months later when you start to process and to analyze the photos you already know that this is the photo in which you are uh, doing the calibration properly okay and uh, as I introduced before, any movement or any small, uh, even slightly movement of the camera will change the calibration uh, dramatically. So the idea is you go to the field, set your camera, fix it properly, check that the camera is uh, taking photos and so on. And you finish the setting of the camera, let's say, and after that, you do this 20 or 25 calibration, okay? And then you don't check the camera anymore. And you leave the this camera trap placement and you go, and you go to the next camera trap point, okay? And after that, when you come back to check the memory cards and the batteries and so on, for instance, one month later, before, again, before to uh, check the batteries and so on, you have to repeat this 20 or 25 placement with the pole, okay? Because, if, again, if you have experience with camera traps, you, you know that it's quite frequent that a wild boar or an animal go and move your camera slightly. So, if in relation to how do you leave your camera in the field and how do you find your camera again when you come back, if an animal go in this period and move the camera uh, slightly, then you have to recalibrate the, the deployment again, okay? So uh, I'm close to finish. So with this deployment calibration that you have to do, we have to also <clears throat> calibrate our camera device. And the idea is that uh, we already provide this calibration of the camera, but in any case, you will have or you will have videos and so on to do the calibration by yourself, but this is what uh, Jim commented before. Okay, you have to calibrate. Let's say that you have Browning, uh, Command, Source Pro, or whatever model. If you have 1,000 of cameras of the same model, you only need to calibrate one of these cameras, not the 1,000 of cameras. And if you are working with, I don't know, Reconi, Superfight, or whatever, or Bruce, or whatever, you only have to calibrate one of these cameras per each model, okay? And then this calibration is useful for all of your cameras. So for that, probably we will calibrate uh, one of these cameras in the in, in before to sending of after sending is not relevant, and then you then you only have to do this uh, deployment calibration, okay? And obviously, then with this calibration, with the calibration of the camera and with the artificial intelligence tools that will be uh, available in AUT, and then you will have the animal location, which if I remember is the key parameter for this method, and then you will have these output output files 
like already Jim uh, commented before. Okay, here remember how important it is to locate the animals in the field of view, and now we know how to do this calibration. And uh, here I finish. So I don't know if you have question or.